Now tonight, we are turning to just one verse of Scripture, and I'm going into the 11th chapter of First Chronicles tonight, actually fudging a little on our sign reading, but we intended to take the first 11 chapters here of First Chronicles. We're only using one verse tonight, and that's the 22nd verse of the 11th chapter of First Chronicles. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Also he went down and slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Our subject tonight is out of the snowstorm. And we take this part of this verse as our text tonight. Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. Now, the Bible lands, for the most part, are semi-tropical. Therefore, the setting of Scripture is largely in a warm climate. And if you have noticed the Scripture in a particular way in this connection, you recognize that. Very little is said about a cold, hard winter or a big snowstorm or these things that you're acquainted with if you've lived in the north. There is an absence of snow in the Bible and an absence of winter. There is, however, a very interesting scripture over in the 10th chapter of John's Gospel, the 22nd verse, the Lord Jesus had gone up to Jerusalem, and it says, And it was at Jerusalem the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. That's one of the few references in the Bible to the cold and to the winter. Now, in spite of all of that, the Scripture does have something to say about the winter wonderland of snow. You remember the Lord Jesus? said something in the Olivet Discourse to his own in that day. He says, pray that your flight be not in winter. Now, I believe that that has to do with the land beyond Palestine. I think he's looking out to the worldwide dispersion of these people. But you'll find in other places of Scripture there is a reference to snow. Remember, among other questions that God put to Job, he asked him this question. He says, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? And you know Job hadn't. He didn't know anything about the snow. He didn't have a microscope. He'd never been able to look down and see that every snowflake is different in design, and at each snowflake is different from the other. And they never have found two that are identical. And each one is a world of wonder within itself. So God asked Job quite a few questions. And he said, Job, have you entered into the treasure of the snow? So evidently Job was acquainted with snow, but he knew nothing about the treasures of the snow. Now the children of Israel, when they passed through the wilderness, they endured every known hardship and handicap in crossing that awful wilderness. Moses twice in the book of Numbers, he says that terrible wilderness. And I'll take Moses' word for it, it was terrible because he spent 40 years in it. And if it was terrible, he ought to know it. And he says it was a terrible wilderness. But in crossing the desert, as far as we know, they did not encounter a snowstorm. Nowhere is there any reference to the fact that they had to go through a snowstorm. Now, snow can be, and it is, a real hazard. It's a real danger. To those people who've lived in the north, they know something of it, and they'd testify to it. But children raised here in California, they think snow's a plaything that the Lord puts up here on the mountain, and you can go up there and play in it when you want to, and then come down and get out of the stuff. But if you had to live in it all the time, it would be a different thing. And for me, it seems foolish. That's one reason I don't go to winter conferences. I went to one. 
It reminded me too much of back east. And I said, never again. I think it's sort of silly to come to California and get out of the snow and then make a point to go back up yonder and get in the stuff uh, when people in the east would give anything in the world to get out of it. And so, as far as I'm concerned, no snow for me if I can keep out of it. But children in California, they think it's a plaything, and they go to the mountains and play in it. But if you had a daily encounter with it, it would cease to be funny. The farmer in the north who has to cut a path to the barn, and then one down to the main road, and who has to handle his livestock in the snow, knows something of the hardships that snow can cause. And the city dweller that has to go out and shovel it all the time knows that it's no toy at all. A few years ago, New York City paid $50,000 just to have the snow from one storm hauled away because traffic was stalled and snarled because of it. Now tonight, we're turning to one of the few references in Scripture to snow, to a snowstorm. Will you listen again? Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. Now, this man Benaiah had performed many outstanding feats of bravery. We're told here he did many acts, and I do not know what they were. I have a notion they could have all been recorded and they would be outstanding feats. But the greatest claim that he had to greatness was this, that he slew a lion, and that's no easy task. He had no high-powered gun. It meant, actually, that he had to come almost into a personal encounter and probably did with that lion in order to kill it. So it was no easy task that he did. The uh, colored boy got a job at the zoo, and the uh, zookeeper said to him, I want you to go in that cage and, and feed that lion. And he said, No, not me. And the zookeeper, to encourage him, he says, That lion says, That lion is raised on milk. And the colored boy said, yes, so was I, but I eat meat now. <laughs> and the zookeeper said to him, said, go on in there. says, that's an old lion. He doesn't even have any teeth. And he said, that may be true, but he could gum me to death. <laughs> and so a lion is something that you just don't like to come into a personal account with. We have great sympathy for that boy because of that. Now, David slew a lion. You remember, as a shepherd boy. That's one of the reports he gave to Saul. He said, on one occasion, I slew a lion. Now, when this man, Benaiah, came to David as one of his mighty men, and this is the catalog of the list of the mighty men of David, the way that Benaiah got in there was that he slew a lion. When that was called to David's attention, David knew that it was not an easy past, and that it was a great accomplishment, because he had had that experience, and really he could talk things over with Benaiah. He could say, now how did you slay your lion? I'll tell you how I slew mine. And I have a notion that they compared notes on this matter of slaying a lion. But you know, the circumstances in which Benaiah slew a lion are very unusual. They weren't just ordinary circumstances. It wasn't just a everyday day that this man slew a lion. It was a snowy day. There had been a snowstorm, and the weather didn't deter him or deter him from this feat that he did. To slay a lion is a, a wonderful feat, but to slay a lion on a snowy day let me tell you, that's something to write down. You see, he was a regular attendant at church, as Father Benaiah was, and when it rained, he didn't stay home. He came out. Uh, he didn't let rain, or he didn't let weather, he didn't let little 
some little objection keeping from serving God. This man, Benaiah, he went out and killed a lion, and he did it on a snowy day. Anybody could have said, well, when it gets pretty, I'll be back to church. You can count on me, preacher, if everything's easy. But here's a man who did it on a snowy day. I hope our nominating committee, if Benaiah is a member of this church, that they'll put him up for an officer. I tell you, we need men like that today in the church. The church needs men who not only can go out and slay a lion, but they'll do it on a snowy day. They'll not let these handicaps, these excuses that men use today stand in their way for doing the thing God's called them to do. Now tonight, I want you to notice three lessons that I want to draw from our text this evening. I don't usually preach a sermon like this. But tonight, I want to draw three lessons from this very wonderful text that we have. The first is the peril of postponement. Second, the power of present action. And third, the persuasion of a dedicated performance. Now, will you look at these three with me tonight? First of all, there is the peril of postponement. There is the danger of delay. Suppose Benaiah had waited until it was a pretty day. Suppose that he said to his wife, I think I'll just wait till the snow melts. After all, it's a bad day, and why get out on a bad day like this? I just well stay in. Everybody else is staying in, and I don't think that I'll get out today. Well, my beloved, the reason that that lion was in the pit was that the lion had the same idea. The lion had stayed away from church also. He didn't want to get out. And the reason he'd hold in temporarily in that pit was the snow had come down and caught him, and he could not make it back into the forest where he lived. At least he didn't want to go in the snow. So temporarily he took refuge in that pit. And he said to himself, I'll just stay here till the snow melts. So you see that if Benaiah had waited until the snow melted and until it was a pretty day and until all the circumstances were favorable, there'd have been no lion to slay. He took advantage of what many call today a hindrance, what many call today a hardship, what many call today a difficulty. And have you ever noticed how people in the past have let these things actually keep them from salvation, actually keep them from God's blessing. Many of God's people miss God's best because they always postpone the opportunity because of some little excuse that they have to offer. And because of that, well, the opportunity goes skating by. And they miss it. The children of Israel came to Kadesh Barnea, ready to enter in. They saw the giants. They saw the difficulties. They did not see God. And Caleb stood up and he said, Let us go in and possess the land. These people said, Not today. The giants are there today. Maybe they'll all die out in a year or two. Who knows but what a plague might hit the giants next year and they'll all die. Then we'll go in. Maybe it'll be easier next month. But Caleb said, let's go in now. May I say that these people never had another opportunity to enter that land. That generation went back into the wilderness to die because they had passed by the opportunity God had offered them. There is the peril of postponement. Remember the rich young ruler who came to the Lord Jesus. What an opportunity he had. A glorious opportunity. And that rich young ruler, he went away sorrowful. He wanted to follow Jesus. But he had great possessions and they stood in the way and the questions always bid, did that rich young ruler ever come back? Many like to think so. 
Many try to identify him with the Apostle Paul. Many try to identify him with John Mark and say, Yes, he came back. I do not know. I do know this, that the one record that we have of him, that he had an opportunity, and he passed that opportunity by, there is a peril in postponement. Many people today are letting that opportunity skate right by them. You remember that there was a man who listened to the Apostle Paul preach the gospel? And you could never hear that man preach the gospel without knowing what it was. And we read that when Paul went before Felix, that he didn't attempt to defend himself. He presented Christ and the claims of Christ to that king. And listen, this is what it said. And as he reasoned of righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. This man, Felix, said, Say, you've interested me. Man trembled. He said, You know, the thing you said is something that I ought to do something about it. He reasoned to him of judgment to come. Felix, you a king have had men stand before you and you've sentenced them. You have to stand before God and you'll be sentenced. But here's a Savior who's already borne your judgment, and you can accept him. Felix said, I dread that day that's coming, and I do need that Savior you are talking about, And but things are all so busy here. I'd like to talk this over with you, Paul, but let's wait till a more convenient day. And as far as the record is concerned, there never was a more convenient day. May I say to you, there is a peril of postponement. And yet, you know, the very snowstorm, that thing that's the handicap and the hardship and the difficulty can sometimes become the instrument of accomplishing God's purpose if a man means business with God. It was a great snowstorm in London, one of the worst that London had had. It came on a Saturday night. Sunday morning, no vehicle could move. A young man by the name of Charles Haddon Spurgeon got out of bed. He was not saved, but he attended church. He saw that morning he'd not be able to get to the church that he regularly attended over on the other side of London. And so he went out in the snowstorm, and he came to a little, it was a mission, he said he never quite knew who the fellow was that morning that spoke because the regular preacher, say, you talk about a snowstorm, the preacher didn't show up that morning. It was really a snowstorm. And uh, so uh, um, this man got up. Spurgeon said later, I do not know whether he was a cobbler or just what he was. He was an ignorant fellow. He didn't have much to say. He got up and he turned over to Isaiah <laughs> and he said, Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, for I'm Jehovah, and be saved. <laughs> and he said that ignorant man, whoever he was, said he, he began to try to explain the text. He said to the few people that were there, he said, This text means that all you've got to do is look. It means that God's not asking you to work out something or do something, but you, if you just look to Jesus, you'll be saved. And after the fellow said, that's about all he had to say. And so what he lacked in lightning, he made up with thunder. And so he just pounded the pulpit with all of his might. And he looked back and he saw this young fellow, Spurgeon, sitting there, and he said, young man, you look miserable. Look to Jesus and you'll be saved. Spurgeon said, I did look. I looked and I was saved. In a snowstorm. <laughs> a snowstorm that was a handicap for multitudes that morning. 
became the instrument of that man's salvation. Oh, there's a peril, my beloved, in postponement. Many Christians today are robbed of God's best. A young man here in Southern California 15 years ago, he talked to me about preparing for the ministry. He attended a seminary here on the West Coast, finished, but never got, I don't know why, just one of these fellows that kept postponing. And so he called me the other day in Dallas. And I said, where are you? He said, I'm in Fort Worth. Well, I said, what in the world are you doing here? Last time he talked to me, it was way over in another state. And he, he said, you know, I'm just on the verge. I'm working over here at one of these airplane plants. But there's a little church out here that's just opened up. And, uh, you know, I'm just ready to become pastor. And I thought 15 years ago, he said the same thing to me. And I expect if I'm around 15 more years that he'll be just on the verge of going into something big, the peril of postponement. He's always let a little snow on the ground, keeping from doing something for God. I said to him, in all these years, what have you been doing? <laughs> well, he said, you know, this has come up, and that has come up, and the other thing has come up. And there wasn't a bad snowstorm in a lot of the things he mentioned. But these things had kept him from the best that God had. I've talked since I've been away with several pastors. I'm very much concerned today about the attitude of the pastors in this land of ours. I rode the other day from the church back to the hotel with one of the finest pastors in the city of Akron. He said this to me. He says, you know, Dr. McGee, I'm disturbed today. I'm greatly disturbed in my church. He said, I have one of the finest churches here. But he says, two people are getting too busy to come to services during the week. They're getting too busy in other activities for God's Word. And he says, it's got so that even in my program, we've almost crowded out the Word of God. I have only one comment. The lion is in the pit today, and it's a snowy day. But if you don't move now, you won't get him. If you don't move today, my brother, it'll be too late tomorrow. He'll be gone. The peril of postponement. And then, will you look at the power of present action? You know that lion had holed up for the snowstorm? And that lion thought he was safe. I do not know what lions talk about when they're holed up like that. But I have a notion, this lion said to himself, say, you know, this is a pretty safe place. And he says, if I know human beings, this little snowstorm will keep all of them indoors. They, none of them will come out. So he wasn't on the alert for hunters. No one would be abroad. He needn't watch out for anyone. And after all, Sunday morning, all the members would be sleeping in. Why shouldn't the lion sleep in? May I say that Sunday morning he was asleep. But Benaiah was not asleep. He caught him off guard. And he killed that lion that Sunday morning. Oh, the power of present action. It is said that the secret of the wonderful military strategy of General Nathan Bedford Forrest, and you will pardon me, won't you, for speaking of this great Southern general because he's recognized today as one of the greatest strategists. When he took Memphis, he did it by a surprise attack. They thought he was 200 miles away. But all night and all day and all the next night, by a force march over difficult terrain in bad weather, the power, the power of present action, he kept moving 
until he got there. The history books say that the Duke of Wellington defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. But Wellington never said that. And the close students of history today, they don't say that. Wellington the night before, when the rain set in, he thanked God for it. He said, we'll strike in the morning because Napoleon's artillery can't move in the mud. And those that are close students of history, they do not say that the Duke of Wellington was the one defeated Napoleon. It was General Mudd. He's the boy that defeated Napoleon, all because a man moved at the right moment. Oh, the power of present action. Livingston is the man who opened Africa. Personally, I think David Livingston is one of the greatest men who ever lived. When Stanley was sent in to find him and finally did and wrote up his account of David Livingston, he said this, he said, I have found a man, a man that is wholly committed to God. And he said, this man, he went where no other man dared to go. The power of present action. Hudson Taylor, the founder of the China Inland Mission, was a defeated missionary along the coast of China. But he didn't go home. He went inland and found the greatest faith mission. At the time, the communists took over China as far as size and effectiveness was concerned. Why? The power of present action. Oh, my beloved, if you're here tonight and you're without Christ, may I say this to you? What must I do to be lost? What must I do to be lost? The answer is nothing. Nothing. You just don't do anything. You are lost. If you're going to be saved, the power of present action is by faith to take Jesus Christ as Savior. How many Christians today have lost all power in their lives. Their lives don't count for God. They're like these three little monkeys you see on death. See nothing, hear nothing, say nothing. In fact, they just do nothing. Oh, my beloved, there is power in present action. If you're going to do anything for God, you ought to get busy. Now, in closing, will you notice this? the persuasion of a dedicated performance. You know, this lion had terrorized the community. A lion was in the street, somebody said. And the writer to the Proverbs has this very interesting proverb. Listen to this. The slothful man saith, There is a lion in the way. A lion is in the street. <laughs> the slothful man, the lazy fellow, the sluggard. They all said, there's a lion out there somewhere and there's snow on the ground. Let's all stay home today. But there was a man by the name of Benaiah. He set himself to the task of killing that lion. Oh, he dedicated his life to that. That was the thing that his whole life was dedicated to. And the snowstorm made no difference. And the fact that it was a lion made no difference. And the slothful man can stay in and say, there's a lion in the street. But now says, that's what I've been waiting to hear. <laughs> I'm going after him. And he went after the lion. Dedicated. All the persuasion of a dedicated life. I think one of the reasons that communism has made such gains it's because of the dedication on the part of some of those that are identified with it. I hate the system. I think it's terrible. But I want to say to you tonight, they have put us to shame as far as dedication is concerned. Dr. Nelson Bell, the father-in-law of Billy Graham, tells this incident he had in visiting the mission field in South America. 
in one of the large cities where communism was running rife, he saw a young man on a street corner preaching communism, and he noticed the young man's shoes. Actually, his feet were sticking out of the shoes. Dr. Bell said, I thought I'd try something. He says, after the young man had finished, I went up to him and I said to him, young man, I'd like to give you $10 to buy you a pair of new shoes. And he says, if I do it, what will you do? And he said, that young man looked at me fiercely, almost savagely. And he said, if you give me $10 to buy shoes, I'll take it to buy literature. What dedication. What dedication. We can't match it. We can't match that kind of dedication today. We must admit, as long as the church Staying in on the snowy day, and especially when there's a lion abroad. The power, oh, the power of present action and the persuasion of a dedicated life. Will you notice this? It was years ago in the state of Texas, in a little town, there was two families. They'd lived next door to each other for 15 years. One was Christian, the other non-Christian. There came one Saturday night a snowstorm, the like of which you can only have down there. Five inches of snow was on the ground the next morning. And the family that was unsaved got up and the man of the house went and looked out. He said, nobody will get out today. And he sat back to read his paper. Family next door on many occasions had invited him to church, had attempted to witness to him. It did no good. And after a little while, he heard a noise, and he looked out, and he saw the door open next door, and that whole family come out dressed up. Came down the walkway, went down the sidewalk, two blocks down the church. He got up, and he stood there in the wind in amazement. He turned to his wife, and he said, Wife, you know... That's got me to thinking. He said, these people are intelligent people. For 15 years, they've been getting up every Sunday morning going to church. We've never been inside that church. Now, there's a reason why this family would get up a morning like this and go down there. Let's, Let's go down and see what it is. That's the morning that that whole family went forward and were saved, the persuasion of a dedicated performance, my beloved. I have here a letter. It was on my desk when I got back. It illustrates what I'm talking about. Here it is in shoe leather today. This letter's postmarked Challenge, California, and I have no notion where Challenge is. The only thing is, I know it's in the mountains, and I know it's a logging town. Will you listen to this? As a small church in the Sacramento mountain range, we greet you warmly in the Lord, desiring every good blessing from above upon your blessed ministry. Then they go on, and down here the lady writes this, said, I'd like to make a little request. Because of the death of four children in our community by pneumonia and whooping cough, Within the past three months, this is because of cold cabins, not enough clothing for some children whose fathers are low-paid tree fallers and who spend much on heavy drink. Yet, after reading your little book on death of a little child, I believe this is just what should be placed in the hands. And then this party goes on to say we have a graduate of Talbot Seminary young fellow up there, and she tells about the hardship that he's got to go through to preach the gospel. I say, here it is in shoe leather tonight, the, the persuasion of a dedicated performance. A young man up there, and she goes on to say, the sacrifice you've got to make if you're going to preach to those people up there. Oh, my beloved, we need tonight a dedication of life to Jesus Christ. The young fellow wrote his girl 
And he waxed eloquent at the end of the letter. He says, I'll swim the deepest river for you. I'll cross the widest ocean for you. I'll scale the highest mountain for you. And I'll wade through snow knee deep to get to you. Then he closed the letter and put a little P.S. at the bottom. He says, if it doesn't rain next Wednesday night, I'll be over to see you. My beloved, that's the way a great many of us are today in our dedication to the Lord Jesus. I tell you, we talk big, but our performance is not very big. And this generation, this beat generation, needs it. Dave Boone, a columnist in the East on an Eastern newspaper, hard-boiled fellow, wrote this the other day. He says it would be a great thing for the world if the members of the churches were not content to be sitters and listeners, but got in there and pitched with the same intensity of thought and spirit that they show in everyday business affairs. May I say that he's missed the spiritual, but he certainly has got the right approach, my beloved. He sees there's a great need today in the church, and right now this beat generation needs something to live for. You know, there's a danger of going in the wrong direction today, looking for something for this generation that has everything, has nothing and it's looking for something, and willing to follow anybody that's beating a drum and carrying a banner. I talked to a young lady, a student at SMU in Dallas the other day. She'd been going to a, one of these Christian groups where one of the students at the seminary there was teaching, and she came over to the lectures. After the very first one, she said, I must talk with you. The next day she came in, and I tell you, she told me a story. Oh, I tell you it's a story. I don't intend to go into detail, but I do want to say this. She'd gone down the wrong path. She'd gone down the wrong path and followed the wrong leader. Oh, there's a tragic danger today of going in the wrong direction and when they see a dedication on the part of someone, they follow him or her today. And today we give a false impression because we are not dedicated, because you and I are waiting for it to quit raining. We are waiting today for the sun to shine. We don't want the wind to blow very much. And when the right moment comes and it's just right and it's convenient to us, we are going to do something for God. My friend tonight, we'll never persuade anybody on the outside that it's worthwhile if we do that. And they'll go after a wrong leader and they're going in the wrong direction. Did you know that tonight America is on the verge of following wrong leadership. Our nation tonight, and especially young people, they're clamoring for something. Oh, to see a dedication of life to Jesus Christ. That's what's needed today. I close with this little story. It comes out of the snowstorm. It was years ago in the Northwest, in the Dakotas. It was a blizzard, and a passenger train was slowly pushing its way into the very face of that blizzard. As the blizzard with its fist pushed right against the train, and it was just inching along on the track. On the train that night was a young woman with a little baby. And she was very nervous. Every time the conductor come through, she said, Now, you remember, I want to get off at so-and-so. And he was weary of that and all the other inconveniences and the terror of that storm. He said, Yes, lady, I know where you want to get off. Now, you sit back and don't you worry. And I'll come and tell you when we get to that stop and let you know. And so when he came through again, she said, have we got there yet? 
And she said, he said, no, I told you I'd tell you when we get there. And uh, finally, a man ahead of her, a man that was a traveling man, turned around and he said to her, said, lady, said, you know, I know this road very well. I travel up and down here and I know the place where you want to get off. Now, I said, you just don't worry. I'll show you where to get off. But that night of the snow, the train stopped at a place where it ordinarily did not stop. And so the man thought the next place was it. And he said to her, now we're coming to your station and I'll help you all. So he got her suitcase and, and helped her get her coat around her and he put her off at that stop. The train went on down the track and in a few minutes the conductor came through and looked. He said, where's that lady that, with the little baby that wanted to get off? The traveling man says, oh, I helped her off back at her station. The conductor said, that wasn't her station. That wasn't her station. We stopped at a place where we ordinarily do not stop. The place where we stopped, there's not a house in a mile. There's actually no station there, just a shed. The train backed up to that place and searching parties were organized. And they went out. Half a mile of where she'd gotten off, they found her. She was frozen to death and the baby in her arms was frozen to death. Wrong directions in a snowstorm. May I say tonight, it's tragic to get wrong directions. And tonight, tonight the world is looking for that which is dedicated. Oh, tonight, friends, that your life, my life, was dedicated to Jesus Christ in such a way that those outside that are looking for something would say, Say, I'll follow them to church today. I'll go after them because they know the way. Oh, tonight, my beloved, do you know the way? Do you know him whom to know aright is life everlasting? It's tragic to give wrong direction. It's more tragic to get off at the wrong station. Tonight, do you have the right direction? Have you trusted him tonight? Shall we pray? As our heads are bowed tonight in this brief moment of prayer, I'm wondering if you've come in here. I'd love this evening to just turn our invitation to believers tonight because we need it. Oh, how we need it. How we need our hearts warm. How we need to see this Savior again. But tonight, my friend, I'm thinking tonight of those that are the unsaved here. And maybe we haven't given you very much of an impression. Maybe we haven't persuaded you very much. But may I say, don't look to us. Look tonight to the Lamb of God. Look as Spurgeon did that night, in the, that morning in the snowstorm. Look to Jesus and be saved. Look to Him. Don't get off at the wrong station. Don't listen to every voice today that's coming along. Listen to the Son of God who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me.